Hello and welcome to Intermediate Financial Accounting 2 Tutorial 10A. This is the first of two tutorials related to accounting for defined benefit pension plans. This tutorial will focus on accounting for defined benefit pensions under IFRS. This tutorial has five key learning objectives. The first will be to review accounting for defined benefit pension plans under IFRS. Second, to review how to construct a defined benefit pension worksheet, or key balances if you choose not to use a worksheet. Pension worksheets aren't uh, mandatory. Sometimes they are helpful to students, but quite often students uh, become focused on memorizing how to create the pension worksheet without fully understanding the concepts. The third objective will be to prepare journal entries to account for defined benefit pensions under IFRS. Fourth, to prepare a partial balance sheet reflecting the defined benefit pension plan account balances as they'd appear on the balance sheet. And the last learning objective to determine the funded status of a defined benefit pension plan. This example is based on the Serenity Limited example, so please make sure that you download the correct file and that you've pre read the information and you're ready to tackle it. We'll first start with requirements 1A and 1B. Assuming that Serenity is a public company and reports under IFRS, we're going to have to basically calculate the pension expense, defined benefit obligation, the plan assets, and the pension liability accounts as at December 31st, 2021. We could also use a pension worksheet, so I will illustrate both ways, first with a pension worksheet, then with just calculating the account balances using T accounts. And so you can choose the approach that works best for you. So let's start with the pension worksheet. What we have here are a series of six different accounts or columns. The area in blue are on the trustee books only. These are not on the company books. and They're also known as memorandum accounts. Even though the company has a defined benefit obligation or DBO, that's actually not on the company's balance sheet as liability. And the plan assets are also not on the company's balance sheet. Those sit with the trustee. What is on the company's records, though, are the net defined benefit, of course, cash, any expense, and other comprehensive income that's applicable to IFRS only. So these, again, are on the company records. NDB, or net defined benefit, appears on the balance sheet, and the expense appears on the income statement. So what we have are starting balances here. The company has a net defined benefit or underfunded liability of 240000 that's comprised of a $900,000 DBO or liability. Negative $900,000 uh, means a credit. In any of these worksheets, negative numbers are credits and positive numbers are debits. So if we take 900000 credit liability plus 660000 debit to the plan assets, that'll result in a net $240,000 liability. And anything in the pension worksheet, all the rows must sum across to zero. So 900 plus 660 minus 240 equals zero. The next item to deal with here are the current service costs. So as you can see, the current service costs from the data are $120,000. The $120,000 has the effect of increasing the DBO. So we're going to add a negative $120,000 to the DBO and then we're going to, so it's a credit, right? So credit the DBO for 120,000 and debit the expense. So the current service costs increase the current period expense. The next thing we deal with is the interest on the DBO. What we do is we take the beginning balance in the DBO, always the beginning balance, and we multiply that by whatever the interest rate is. So in this case, the interest rate is 7%, so that gives us $63,000. So that $63,000 is credited to the DBO. It's a negative. It's credited. It increases the size of the liability and also increases the current period expense. Once we have the current service costs and the interest on the DBO, now we can look at the interest on the plan assets. What we do in the pension worksheet is we include the expected interest, not the actual. And how we calculate the interest is we take, again, the beginning balance of the plan assets of $660,000. We multiply that by 7%, and that gives us 46,200 expected interest. And so we're going to debit that to the plan assets. What this has the effect of doing is increasing the balance of the plan assets. And then the credit actually goes to offset the expense. It doesn't go to revenue. It goes as an offset to the pension expense. Now, the next item is actually very easy. It's the contributions. 
So all that happens is we add 216,000 contributions into the plan assets that gets paid to the trustee. And of course that comes out of cash. So we have a debit to the memorandum account for the plan assets for 216,000 credit to cash that increases the plan asset, decreases cash. The next item is quite simple. The benefits paid, no calculation necessary. This is a given number. So with the benefits paid, one thing to uh, note is that the benefits are not paid by the company, the benefits are paid by the trustee, so there's no cash in the transaction. Okay, a lot of students make the mistake and, and sign some journal entry somewhere, put benefits in cash. All that happens here is the defined benefit obligation decreases by 14400 on the trustee's books, and the plan assets will also decrease. The next item has to do with the difference between the actual return and the expected return. You see, in the data, we're given the actual return on the pension. But in our calculations here, we calculated the expected return. So what has to happen then is we need to account for this difference. And in our example, the actual return was 21,000, but the expected return based on the percentage that the plan is supposed to generate should have generated 46,200. This results in a difference of 25,200, and that's a loss. We call that a remeasurement loss. The remeasurement loss is reflected in a reduction in the value of the plan assets. And here's the special case for IFRS. So with IFRS, the remeasurement loss goes to OCI. It does not go to pension expense. And the other interesting thing to note then is when you take the sum of the interest on the expected and offset whatever you have for the remeasurement gain or loss, this must work out to be the actual 21,000. Now for the very last item. The only thing left is to deal with the fact that we are told that the beginning balance on the DBO and the ending balance on the DBO. If we take all the numbers that we had so far, the opening balance and the current service costs and the interest on the DBO and the benefits paid, we would not end up with this desired ending balance of a million twenty-five. There's something missing. And that missing item in this particular case is what we call a remeasurement gain. It could be a remeasurement loss, it depends. But what happens is we basically simply plug the number to make the ending balance end up being what it's supposed to be. If you were to take the million twenty-five, add the fourteen four, and then take off the sixty-three thousand for the interest, take off the one twenty thousand and the nine hundred, that ends up with forty-three thousand, and that's a remeasurement gain. So what that means is the obligation that the company has has actually gone down based on actuarial assumptions and calculations. So whenever the liability drops, that means the company owes less money. So that would be a gain. If the company owed more money then you would have a remeasurement loss and that increases the size of the liability. This particular item decreases the size of the liability because as you can see here it's a debit because it's a positive balance. The pension plan DBO gets debited and then the credit goes to other comprehensive income with IFRS. It's going to be a little bit different under ASPE but under IFRS that's where it goes. That basically results in a completed pension worksheet now. What we have here if we look at our sums across the million twenty-five plus the eight eighty-two six hundred should equal the net defined benefit or the NDB. If we take a million twenty-five credit plus eight hundred eighty-two thousand six hundred debit, that results in a net ending liability that will show up on the company's balance sheet of one hundred and forty-two thousand four hundred dollars. So then what we have here is a completed worksheet with our red box now highlighting the journal entry piece. If you look at what needs to happen, if we have a beginning defined benefit of 240,000 and an ending defined benefit of 142,400, we've gone from a credit balance of 240 to a credit balance of 142,400. So that means we need to debit that particular account by 97,600. Cash will get credited for 216,000. And then the expense is the sum of the current service costs, the interest on the DBO offset by the interest that's expected on the plan assets. So that's a debit of 136,800. And if we take our remeasurement loss on the pension plan and the remeasurement gain on the obligation, that results in a net credit of 18,400. Now we can actually complete the journal entries. On December 31st, we're going to debit the pension expense for 136,800. 
we're going to credit OCI, pension remeasurement gain or loss, for 18,400, and then credit the net defined benefit liability for the balance of 118,400. Then the last piece of the journal entry is to deal with the actual pension contribution in cash. So we're going to debit the net benefit liability for 216,000 and credit cash. This next piece is an alternative to the pension worksheet. If you like this way, then you can do it this way. If you don't, you can go with the pension worksheet. We'll first look at the DBO, defined benefit obligation. We start with the beginning balance, 900,000. Then we add the current service costs. We add the interest on the DBO of 63,000, which is based on the beginning balance times 7%. Then we subtract the benefits paid, which is also a given. So take off the benefits of 14,400. And because we are given a number of the ending balance of a million twenty-five, then we have to adjust or plug or balance the remeasurement gain or loss. If the item reduces the pension liability, the DBO, then it's a gain or if it's in brackets, like everything else is, that increases the liability, then it would be a loss. Now, if you're a fan of T-accounts, what I've done here is I've shown what this would look like if you wanted to use a T-account. The beginning balance is a credit, of course. The CSE increases the obligation. The interest on the DBO increases the obligation. The benefits go on the left side, a debit to decrease the obligation. We're given an ending balance here, and so that means we have to plug the DBO liability for the 43600 This is actually the way I prefer to do it. It's quick, and if you remember what goes into the DBO account, then you can do it very effectively. Next up is an alternative to the plan assets. We start with the beginning balance of 660000 which is given. We add the expected return of 46200 The contributions are added to that. Then we take out the benefits of 144, And then we take the difference between the actual and the expected to give us our remeasurement gain or loss. In this case, it's remeasurement uh, loss because it'll reduce the asset and give us an ending balance of 882,600. If you're a fan of T-Account, set one up for the plan assets. Start with a beginning balance of 660,000. You add the expected interest on the plan asset. You also add the contributions. You take out the benefits. Here we have to take the actual less the expected. We know that the actual is 21,000, the expected is 46,200. We also know that the actual return is less than the expected return. So therefore, that's going to give us a loss. It's a credit of 25,200, yielding us an ending balance of 882,600 in the pension account, and it's done. The last item that we have an alternative for is just the pension expense. The pension expense includes the, the current service costs, which is given. We calculate the interest on the DBO as 7% of the beginning balance, and then we take off the expected interest on the plan assets, again, based on the beginning balance. So 660 times 7% is our interest offset. Again, it's a negative, right? A negative to the expense is an offset, giving us 136,800 pension expense. The rest of the question will fall into place quite easily. Our third requirement is to prepare a partial balance sheet illustrating how the pension would appear as at December 31st, 2021. So in good form here, of course, the name, partial balance sheet as at December 31st, 2021. In this case, we know that we have a liability. The NDB has a credit balance. We're going to classify the pension as a long-term liability. Of course, this only makes sense. The pension liability will not be exhausted within the next year as we have people retiring over many, many years. And that's all there is to it, 142400 and that's the balance sheet presentation. The last requirement, D, is going to have us determine what the funded status of the pension plan is at December 31st, 2021. This requirement is pretty straightforward. There's nothing fancy about it. We simply take the difference between the plan assets and the defined benefit obligation, which gives us 142400 That also happens to be the same as the net defined benefit liability in this case. It tells us that we are underfunded, right? Whenever we have a liability, we are underfunded, in this case, to the tune of 142400 Our DBO exceeds our plan assets. Nothing to be afraid of if you're underfunded. 
It just means that the company doesn't have enough assets currently to satisfy the total obligation. However, not all of the retirees are going to draw all of their pension at once, so it's not necessary. Now let's wrap up with some key points to remember. The defined benefit obligation, the DBO, the plan assets, or PA, and the net defined benefit, or NDB, all of those items are actually calculated the same under IFRS and ASPE. Even though we haven't done the ASPE approach yet, which we will in the next tutorial, they are calculated the same way. The interest expense on the DBO and the interest earned on the plan assets are always calculated using the opening or beginning balances. Third, a pension worksheet is helpful, but not necessary unless specified by uh, your instructor. Next, the pension plan assets and obligation are not recorded anywhere on the company's financial statements. They are held by the trustee in the pension plan. So that represents the blue shaded area that I was showing you in the pension worksheet. On the other side, though, the net defined benefit asset or obligation is reported on the company's balance sheet and is identical under ASPE and IFRS. The other thing to remember is that under IFRS, any remeasurement gains or losses on the DBO or plan assets are booked to other comprehensive income. All right, that's important, and only under IFRS. And finally, the determination of the funded status is the same under both ASPE and IFRS and basically represents the net defined benefit asset or liability. This concludes tutorial 10A. If you want to now go on to tutorial 10B to review accounting for defined benefit pension plans under ASPE.